everybody and welcome this morning. This is Tevo DRC Creative Leadership, also as Tevo Creative Apostolic Ministry Mentoring. Apostolic in our meaning means you are called by God to birth something from the Lord, an original work. And I am a chief apostolic when I say that, and I don't mean it in anything except in the Apostle Paul meaning an off-scouring of the world, this present day, and then as a lowercase training doctrine originator, hopefully, to help spur people on to research Noble Berean Bible research the field of Christian, Christianity, ministry, born again, all that, to really get a future church, an ongoing future church to emerge, to merge all colors, not just one color, not one size, not one style. So this is why I'm teaching, and I'm going to tell you today, at the Lord's leading, why I teach and address false doctrine. And I'm going to give you some examples, personal examples, and I'm going to tell you that I have a pure heart because every time, I think one of the reasons, I know one of the reasons I know so much, you know, a lot about doctrine in the present day ministry, especially Holy Spirit kind, prophetic kind, is because I was sent among them and I realized I better see, is it me that accuses? Is it me that is unjust? Is it me that's true or false sitting there calmly in a respectful fashion, just visiting, recurring, whatever. And it got my attention as a red flag that a lot of this is spread out throughout the world, the United States. And it made me really focus on Jesus' name. <laughs> who's true, who's not, am I, am you. Only God knows for sure if I am or you are. But we really got to work on being mature now, emotionally healthy for the sake of the Lord and the gospel, not the gossip, but the gospel, and for the beautiful people that may be wounded and never want to go back, that may be hurt, biased against, gossip, Judas betrayed, or all sorts jumped in public. And that was what I'm going to tell you today, a couple of jumped in public things. All right. When I know the turf, I want to set the stage. My dad was a pastor, servant leader, unsung not biased, not racist, love my mother, not the things of the world, but they were not, they were dignified, educated, but they were not poor, but they were scholarly. And I came down from both, and he was a pastor, but he was not a stickler for being, he was a Baptist back then, back then, but it was not stuck to be Baptist. It was like Christian who happened to be told by God, I want you to sign up through the Baptist. So he did that. So I came up from a culture of well-read, well-brought-up, and also scholarly, Bible scholars on both sides of the family. Also teachers and ministers, males and females, men's usually more in business, and the women with a ministry. But then, and my aunt came along, myself, many others, they were ministers in their own right. So it isn't like this is brand new, not made up, not playing, not wannabeism, just trying to be real for the sake of anybody who can catch a glimpse of what they may be called by God to do after this, to study the Bible and train and equip leadership, whether you're in a church, out of a church, black, white, brown, Pentecostal, or not tongue-dogging. So I was not raised around bias by God's grace, amazingly. And I was not raised around anti-Pentecost, even though my father had been to the seminary and graduated, and he believed, he personally believed that the, the moving of the gifts, the Holy Spirit had stopped, tongues talking and all that, praying in the Spirit, in the day of the first church. I do not, and later I had experiences through my life which validated it, and many people, all the rest of the family members did. But I grew up not surrounded by any kind of false teaching to my knowledge. Now, see, here's the thing. Nobody in the world, no human, famous or unknown, will have 100%, 150% true teaching. Nobody knows it all. Nobody can grasp it all. And I won't say I do or they did. I'm saying that it is a percentage, because I prayed about it. I said, Lord, what do we do when we come across a lot of faults, even occult, witch-watching type, detrimental to the character, to the young, suspicious, or even and or flaky using it to uh, 
you know, wield power and money and all that. What do we do, Lord? How do we tell who and what is true am I? Because, see, bottom line, you and I are going to stand alone before the throne, so we may as well get our minds up, made up, to not miss it with God's help. So I said, Lord, what about, you know, all these people, all these Christians are out there all the time on their pomp and ceremony calling people false this, false that. Fal I grew up with it for the last 30 years, 20 years, not when I was with the Baptists or the Catholics or the black. Now, you know, surely they can do that. But I was with Scent from early on prior to TV, Mega, to the, really the spirit-filled groups. Now, here's how. So I didn't grow up with a bias against Pentecost, but I didn't want it to grow into air. I was a Baptist, and then a Jesus people movement type, you know, just wanting to get into the whatever the Lord's doing. I'm not traditional. I try to be Bible. I try to be a scholar, but I try to be low-key. So I remember the moves of the Holy Spirit came in college, and I went off campus, and I did, in praise and worship was brand new, and I did ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which they call it. So I did get the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I do, it was low-key. Never shook me, never threw me down. It was a very calm, but very helpful, frankly. And I've done it a lot. I hold, do it a whole lot through the years. But nobody has to know. It isn't like a big deal. And I'm not dogma, dogmatist. My dad was never into that. And he yet... My father, if I talk about any man in the glory of God who lived his life not performing, not achieving, but just loving and being servant leader led, Holy Spirit led, on and off the stage of the pulpit, whatever, I, and behind the scenes where you note it as his child, is my dad. Love, love is so much more important than achievement and power. It is just what is planted into this hard drive, this person's hard drive who he raised as a human, not as a woman, but as a girl and as a wife, you know, and all that stuff. He did things that made me want to accept Jesus. He didn't force me to do it, nor my mother. So we weren't Pentecostal, didn't know the vocabulary, didn't know the other doctrines. This is it, the secret doctrines inside different kinds of movements. Now, every movement, White, black, or brown will have their other hidden leather, you know, different doctrines mixed in, mixture into the doctrinal bath waters. It's up to you how much, and this is my bottom line I meant to conclude. When I said, Lord, how much is it before you call somebody? Do you ever call anybody out loud by name a movement as false? And the Lord told me, and I say this to urge you to be cautious. He said, there's nothing wrong with talking about it in private, confronting it. But he said to every person, the average human, it's really between you and God and your conscience and the Bible. How much you'll stand, how much to really feel in your spirit before you're controlled, before it's Hollywood, before it's uh, making it up, pleasing people, law, legalism. It's really between you and God how much you can stand or your conscience hurts you before God says, do not stay their faults. It's a percentage. And I liken that to people in ministry. I know a lot of Christians who watch movies. They can watch movies and movies, and I can't watch them. I cannot watch. I'm not saying not to. I'm not a legalist. But for my personal call before the Lord, I cannot sit there and ingest in my mind, will, and emotions, my soul, things that would be perverted or bad, you know, damaging or fake stuff that is hurtful, poisonous to my soul. Therefore, my ears as well. So I'm always careful when I listen to rock music all my, you know, growing up days. I liked it. I watched, for some reason, uh, the lifestyles of the people, the words I was listening to. And then at one point, I was told by God after college, right around college, to stop the worldly music, and I've really always caught my ear, because I'm a human person, I'd take aerobics and stuff through the years, and I like all kinds of music and lively music, but I'm not saying it's, I'm a Puritan by any means, I'm just saying I'm careful, I'm more careful about what I perceiver, discerner, look at, and therefore, 
it made me sensitive in a healthy way, usually positive, to know if I'm if there's bias, racial, maternal, peer, whatever. I don't know why, because I wasn't raised around it. One, two, I'm just perceptively in that fashion, given that by God, like people in their DNA, with the Holy Spirit for the mission. So as I grew up and went to college, I did get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then later I got called to what they call now public ministry. And it was always in the praying in the spirit, renewing my mind in the word, all that, which I am for. However, we didn't know all the weirdness, the world, the flesh and the devil, the types, the now typecasting systems would come forth. We didn't know our nation would go down the number of church follower, you know, Jesus followers going down in decline, the racism, the bias, people who call themselves a Christian and do horrible things. I will mention what got my attention was the, you know, the, when Matthew Shepard, the gay young man many years ago was mercilessly slaughtered because he was gay, that I just could only imagine, I could picture white, white, righteous calling themselves a Christian would say we did it and it really bothered me along with the media pulling that out and using that against us and the cynicism when I'm on the front lines grassroots all my life intentionally the cynicism about if you say you're a Christian to a non-Christian liberal white or black usually white so I was out here sent and I'm pro-human I'm pro everyone hearing I'm pro-life but I'm not pro predestination. I'm not pro cult. I'm not pro bias. I'm not pro judging people and not being loving to them and respectful if they're not your Bible theological type, lifestyle type, look, gender, whatever. I'm just not that way. That is to me when I look at and compare it to Jesus Christ as he went about doing good in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, he was not like that. So that must mean it is anti-Christ to be biased, to have that look, to be elite, all those things that are now going on. All right. So when I had been called by the Lord from servant leaderhood and sir, out on the front lines, loving people, just, you know, nice people chatting and loving and witnessing. Then I had first responder, my aunt, help the poor and the homeless and, and, and I, I love that. It's really me. So there are all these things that are like, oh, just out in the grassroots where the rubber, the real life rubber really meets the road in Christianity. And that's my field. That's why I talk about it. Because we were out here during the times prior to the media taking hold in Christianity. During the time it grew, going through rough patches, really in the process. That's mine is, the, if you call it what I do, what I've lived process the progress slow and whatever or fast in the process the overall long-suffering process is it that's the way I would think Jesus went about doing good so we're here with real life where one you know relationship rubber meets the road and I had good family healthy role models none of this back talk none of this weirdness that now comes with I think big cesspools of cloned religion systems something certain systems so when i was grown up and then i did at the holy spirit and i did get the revelation and i do know the word and the lord said at 24 i would like for you to study the different kinds of christians that believe the bible that are truly born again and i will lead you and one day this is when i was 24 prior to mega Holy Spirit just starting in our nation, praise and worship just beginning. Thank God for that. No famous big eyes back then in the Christian sense, basically. So the Lord said, I want you to study my body, and one day I'm going to have you build bridges of understanding and community between the different kinds. I thought, oh, that sounds good. Would I have suspected, would I have dared think like know what I know today no who could have figured this out only Holy Spirit so when you look at the example as a Bible is this biblical that she could do it? you know anybody could do it yes if you look at 
uh, grandson of Adam, Enoch. He walked and talked with God daily, and one day he was not. He walked and talked with God daily. 365, back in college, prior to being 24, I did say, because I knew the Holy Spirit and my parents, both sides of the family, Presbyterian, Methodist, but mostly Baptist and Presbyterian, they had all been led by the Spirit without even any kind of tongue talking. So that was in my nature to be, you know, because you don't, here's the bottom line, you do not want to miss God's perfect will and your blessings and your protection. That's why you're led. So I knew to be cautious and discerning, read the Bible, to be, be balanced, always fellowship. And I was, so in, when I was 18 or 19, I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, I don't want to miss your perfect will for my life. So I'm going to ask you to lead me by your Holy Spirit every day from now on. And I'll just do what you want me to do. And whatever you want me to be, you just work that out. So he did. <laughs> Weird, but he did. And he does. So that had been set in place before 24. So when I was out of college, before children and married, um, it was like, oh yeah, it was a choice. I don't have to do this, but God said, I want you to do that. So of course I wanted to. Didn't know what it would mean, and I went on my way. And then slowly, eventually, day in, you know, I'd do my normal things. Then I would be led, oh, go to that meeting. Oh, go, you know, or he'd have me, or go here, and I'd bump pe into people. Or I'd be invited, because I had my own ministry after a while, with black and white. I was, prior to public ministry, I had black and white reconciliation and repentance for revival among ministers and churches on my heart big time. So I always participated in area gatherings. But then after a while, the Lord would lead me and I went to study different movements. It turned out I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to Faith. I went to Vineyard. I've been to Missionary Baptist. I'd meet people that were fun and loving and I'd be invited or I'd felt led to go to conferences. So I went to North Carolina, shot to um, South Carolina, spoke even Tampa, Many times, Central Florida, Orlando, up to the Panhandle, around many times. And I've noticed the different kinds of Christians and the different moves of God's Spirit. Many really good. Many unusual. But I was not a crit critic. I was a discerner. And I could think, yeah, I can see that. I can handle it. So I enjoyed it. I love the music. The worship had started. All these good things. I was in all kinds of Pentecostal, Holy Spirit moves. It turns out black and white and brown. I even oversaw. God had it. So I bumped into somebody at a meeting and I was invited as a leader. I had my own ministry for many years, 15 years in Virginia called The Encouraging Word. And I was on media and I wrote a newsletter and was invited to pastors and leaders gatherings to repent for revival which i thought should was the norm for all christians everywhere but it's not all right so that set my stage and my heart for what i really would like to do again i really need to do that again i love to meet and gather for reconciliation to hear the heart of god males and females i was never sent to only one kind only one kind in the spirit only one race only one gender i was sent to males and females mostly males for a long time because a lot of women <laughs> didn't have the confidence like they do now to be capable to be really, you know, so we're discerning of doctrine. I still believe in chain of command. If you're legally wed and a Christian and they're both Christians, then they go by chain of command, not control, but Ephesians 521 as well as 522, as I saw witnessed in my parents and their parents before them. But it wasn't like, oh, you know, little woman or anything. It was just like partners in case of tie breaking. So I believe in chain of command. I've always been a quiet person. Now let me get to the unusual things. You know, one of the movements, you learn things at different times out in the field. And one of the movements, the head founder of, you know, one of the pioneers of a movement said, to choose what's hay, throw out the stubble. Keep what's hay and throw out the stubble. And I believe that is a real wisdom for any movement, any teacher, because there's a lot of Phariseeism. A lot of people don't know their bones of the basic scriptures in the New Testament minus the law. A lot of people have now combined it with fantasy, plastic, uh, ceremony, and celebrity. So you got to, and I'm not putting anybody that's flashy or well known down. I'm saying we are very trying to be healthy, enjoy the good production, 
because there it, you know, it's good to have good protection, but not to be moved if it's basically you know something isn't right about it. Those that particular one. So when I was led by the Spirit, I always felt that it was the call of the Lord. He called me to have a ministry, so I did have one. I wrote in a newsletter, gave a word of the Lord, daughter of Issachar. I was around town. I had a meeting, had helpers and all that. Not famous, not trying to be, but just learning what it takes. A lot of warfare. I taught the Bible. I was at first taught a started in a mega church of 1200 that was the mega church of the area back then speaking in tongues but it wasn't it was like natural natural what's first god what's second well the fear of the lord and god what's second family doing your right thing by your family your mate your you know then the ministry and that's what i did i actually had i knew more people that i could trust it was a sincere area basically and I had board members, and I purposely was accountable. Now, I did not know that if you are not in fellowship, friends with, in their network, that that is not good enough for some of the false teaching I was about to uncover. <laughs> oh, one thing that helped me was knowing the different kinds of movements before they got hyper, before they got perverted by the next, you know, whatever went on in media and fun and all this stuff, playtime. I knew that their basic kernel doctrines God had me allow that I live by today. And one of them, the word of faith has been very helpful. I'm very selective now with, because we know some of the controversy, but we're not materialistic. We're trying not to be, we're trying to hear God and let it reveal, not achieve it. And a lot of people, if you study the head movement, they weren't like, they were like that too. It's the later group that takes it, runs with it my opinion after 40 years of this all right so we honored the fathers and the mothers of the all the moves and we don't find fault we just pick out hay from stubble and only keep the hay so what started me and helped me a lot was learning from i think it was kenneth hagan jr's group which i'm not under anybody i'm not on their payroll i'm not under all these people because for and i, I barely for reasons of not being preferential barely communicate or or give because i'm honoring them after all these years they carry what they a lot of this if you go to the original organic it floats so i'm honoring you so what i got was paul's prayers he prayed persistently which i've done which helped me jump start was ephesians the prayer paul prayed for the churches in ephesians 1 3 and colossians 1 and those helped me a lot but then it took years because you, you know, that, that is a slow thing. Nothing has been quick over here. Noah. Let's call it more like a Noah. <laughs> a Noah time with Pauline shipwrecks. All right. Noah time. But we're happy. The, what I learned, though, is the staying power. God's staying power and faithfulness and being led by the Spirit protected. Self-government 24-7. So my scripture for that would be being led of the Spirit. I forgot the second one. One is Enoch, Genesis 5. Enoch, Enoch walked and talked with God daily, and one daily day he was not. The whole church, there are a lot of Enochs out there right now, you know, <laughs> hearing God walk and talk with God daily. Maybe it's a generation ready to be taken, you don't know. The other one would be Ezekiel 1, the Holy Spirit gyroscope the vision of the wheel within the wheel. The wheel would go that way at the leading of the Holy Spirit, and the leading, leading would turn and go that direction. That is Holy Spirit inward witness, balanced by the Bible and good advice, being accountable, and being faithful unto the Lord on and off the stage. All right. So when I was on the journey, and the Lord said, go here, and I was like, how many years? 15, 12 to 15 years of blissful, blissful discovery blissful discovery of the body of christ warm genuine all colors getting along repenting it was just blissful none of this stuff stubble which later came as the years went by and immaturity started to get the helm of office titles when the titles get big the heads go with swell if they have it is my opinion, if they've had poor training, bad backgrounds, maybe unforgiveness or toxic relationships with males or females.
or maybe don't love themselves, have no self-esteem. It's poor self-esteem. The higher the title, the bigger the title, the smaller the ministry. I think it's really unhealthy, unhealthy esteem. Their esteem is not in God completely. And that's what the Lord dealt with me before the rough patches. He, I didn't know it, but he wouldn't let, he, he worked on me and got my attention with a, some minor shakings when I was a young mom. And it was like, cause back then you're into houses, you know, the Demas temptation houses, lands, your mom, you know, you look like all the moms. You want to get your children dressed like the other kids. You want to do all this stuff which is a temptation, and it ain't all sin, not at all. You want to be healthy, balanced. But when the Lord dealt with me, I realized, he said, Tavo, only let Jesus be the source of your esteem. And I never taught it till now. I didn't realize how much God's ministry to me in that he or she who compares themselves with another is not wise. That is the day of now. That is FOMO. Before it happened, fear of missing out, Instagram type stuff. Also, keeping up with the Joneses. And the Lord said, Tavo, keep your eyes on yourself. Look nice, but don't compete. So I haven't. So it helped me because my esteem, because of great parenting and God's mercy. My esteem has never been, in, and my value has never been in my look, my title, my size, my favor, my numbers, my popularity, and or cash, and or friends. It's not been that way. My house, or not, I have house, big houses and small, none houses. It doesn't matter. I'm on the journey, like a pilgrim, one of the pilgrims on the progress, because it's all going to end. Demas will not make it. It will be Holy Spirit eternity. And that is why I really believe God has allowed me to live this out to witness and testify for his ministers to get their perspective, to get going again. You've got a lot of growing to do. So this was before I had marital abuse, violence, deprivation, emotional control, and silent treatment, which when you're by yourself as a private captive, nobody knows about it, no family, then you either have God or you could go down. And I did. I, it took me years to recuperate. But I also was around town giving piano lessons, a mom, so nobody would really want to know it. I didn't want people, you know, I wanted to keep it together. God wanted me to, and he gave me strength. If you go to celebration of his word one day, celebration of his word, celebration of his word music.com there is a song i wrote in 2000 called for all you shamas shama for all you shamas fighting in your pea field wielding your sword all alone god is with you in your battle he is right there beside you even in your home so god is with me he has been with me he is with me and many of you that are like this so I didn't realize the need to be proactive and this courageous and bold to speak until I went to DFW. I was sent <laughs> to DFW where I saw the need to train ministers and basic Christian leaders at the time. Subcultures, uh, not all, but subcultures, many giant subcultures against bias. So I got EORR, equal opportunity, real respect for the office of every human out of that to not be a wuss against bias, misogyny, show. I'd never been around it. I'd never seen that. I never had, I was not women's, li I was, I was raised liberated, not under the law and in the fear of the Lord, which I guess this crowd, this mega crowd of misogynists has not. So there for the grace of God we go. But for the sake of the future church and the many people are getting, because they look white or black or brown, they're getting, and they're called Christian. They're getting mixed up with this crowd by the cynic and it's making it unpopular i'm going to speak plainly to give them and get their attention to call it introspection that's what we're doing all right god wanted me to speak about a couple of instances that are really doctrinally false doctrine gone haywire all right so when i was 24 god said i want you to study the body i thought oh that sounds good let's do it so i did 
he would lead me. And then in the 90s, when he sent me into the Holy Spirit worship fields, and it was Spirit of Prophecy training, it was the first time I'd ever met accusation. It was the first time I'd ever met, I guess, looking back, false teaching, mixed in with some really good. I didn't realize that there were legalisms about who are you under. It's our business to know. And we demand to know, even if we don't speak to you, to find out who you really are. It's a culture. And so I had a board, but nobody wanted to speak. <laughs> they just wanted to know me from their serious prowess. And I'm a, you know, I've got <laughs> the similar, I don't do this. Because I have also good background training that you don't, that's evil. To have, a, you know, to never speak, that's pride. That's weird. It's just false. To accuse people spread rumors, and I wrote Ode to Whelp, Ode to Whelp at the top of onlinefellowship.us to see what the fruit of that, no fear of the Lord, but fear of whatever man-pleasing spirit, demon spirit, it's awful. So I was not raised around it, made it glaring, and yet I was, I was much experienced in many ways, but I was more timid and also going through abuse, violence in my private life, which made me just reserved because you don't know exactly God has given you a call and it's happening, but you just are not famous and you're not elevated and you're not with the crowd who now looks like there. It is the style to be them. And you know what? It's okay. They could be their style, but I was on a different mission. I cannot say that I was there for any reason except really it helped me to know the Holy Spirit more and get in the, briefly out of the stress of being domestically, emotionally abused. Because you have two children, you're teaching, you're, you know, you look like you're doing well. And because of God and good parenting and His grace, I was. I can really be happy no matter how nasty a person can be or how di diabolic. It may be not fun, it may create pain. But it's nothing to be ashamed about. It is something that I just am going to address because many people are going through this. And you need to know you're not evil or the enemy of these kinds of people. It's evil. That what goes on under the name of... So all this, Friendly Fire Fellowship, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, 1 Timothy 6, 5, from such turn away fellowships have come out of this. A warning. A real warning to this kind of doctrinal subgroup right so when i was around town new moves started to come in where i used to live back before dallas new moves came in with this false teaching i didn't know it was false i didn't i'm not suspicious i went in there but i had prayed i'd been through word of faith which were happy clappy and praisey and i learned and then i was not word of faith i was my own kind and I liked that, but the Lord said, now go to this part. And they showed me the difference in kinds of ministries that reflect God, that can reflect God if they're careful. If they're careful, type A is more assertive, happy, clappy, more praisey. Type B can be more introspective, you know, because they're made, people are made differently, psychologically, emotionally, all these things. So I went into this group and I noticed that these were my first really dressed down group. And they were like, you know, all looking more, <laughs> more, you know, into themselves. And I, nobody smiled. I noted that because I do smile. So I noticed that. And so I would go there and my friend, uh, I had had so much stress. I was near burnout. You can get into the word movement if you're not careful and make it work. So my aunt did that. And I watched that. I gotta, you can't say you're sick. You can't, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You got to keep the word. You got to keep, so you can get into works. I don't do that. So I pulled out because I was getting, it wasn't healthy. I was getting too programmed to achieve, to try to work it and earn it with quoting the word and nothing against quoting the word. It's your own person doing it into achievement or getting into error, you know, so I, God pulled me out and he took me where they were not into that. They were into the prophetic, hearing God, perceiving God, and worship. Really good worship. So I went there and I could feel I needed that. I knew a balance. I have a scripture for that. God gave me Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine when he spoke to the Sadducees. 
Jesus spoke to the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. He said, you err. You err, all of you err. Not knowing the scriptures, how the word works, what faith is and is not, how to quote the word, stand in the word, the promises of God, the logos and the rhema of word. All right. And you err, not knowing the scriptures, the potential of the scriptures or the power of God. You can know both and get better. So I realized he was educating me. He had done that in the Word. I grew up with the Bible all my life as the sound doctrine. Thank God. Got into the more Holy Spirit with the Word. Then he took me to the Holy Spirit more than the Word. They were going for the prophetic Word. Now see, I don't... I believe that those groups who are not joyful, false teaching, are pathetic. You can have pathetic because the fruit in the seats is where I meet them. They're a little bit need counseling, well, you know, dependent. Not all, but I was there on a learning curve and a training curve. And I know the Holy Spirit, but I really thank for the, I knew the worship leader and I was there really for that, not the prophetic word. So we're not angry with them, but we're we've really been fighting this spirit of false religion that is tough since that time. It is biased. It is clannish. It is almost occult psychic in certain groups because it's around the nation, not just that one. So when I was there, I had a board, but I would go alone. Here is the big deal for this kind of group, the witch watchers. I'm doing this with glasses because I'm a stereotype for this group around the nation the bias guy. That's fine. I hope when somebody shows up that looks like me, they you think it's me and your behavior selves. All right. That's all right. So the Lord said, on the journey of my walk, if you see something three times or more that hurts people or my good name, I want you to mention it and teach on it. That's why I'm doing this. It's a lot more than three times. So when I was out in the field and had my own work and then privately going through pain and a lot of need, big pain and then forgiving and then trying to, you know, keep on going for the Lord and keep the home together and give music lessons and be a mom and forgive everybody and forgive myself. I didn't realize that my being alone was a big attention getter to the false teaching. The false teaching says... They come in pairs. Oh, I'll give you scriptures. What about Elijah? What about Paul? What about, uh, you know, all these different, Noah? What about all these different ones? Abraham was called alone. What about all those? All right, not a big deal. What about Hannah on the front porch of the steps? That was, was it really? That was it. Hannah grieving because of persecution. A grieving lone woman goes to the temple and is attacked, accused for being drunk when she's grieving and that is my story this is a lot of this story about the false teaching all right we forgive them oh no it's not forgiving here's why god said if you see it three times or more people that accuse people unjustly never speak to them were not respectful on the name of jesus their office ministers then you teach on it because you see here's the word of the lord he said if i show you allow you to be there when you see something happen three times or more in your journey and it reflects the devil instead of God, train on it. That's why I'm training on it because he said, you will see only three times. I'll see much more. So I've dealt with people who are blame shifters, people who are dishonest. I've dealt with that too, but this is huge. All right. For the Holy, I deal with Holy Spirit. I love Holy Spirit. So, when I was there, I had favor until <laughs> I started to, you know, I'm a prophet, I'm a seer, so I know when I'm being talked about and prayed against, and it's a cult. It is occult and a cult, all right? I just didn't know it. So then I would be traveling on journeys, and I'd bump into similar when I would go toward conferences, some big conferences, where I was just sitting there being a great, grateful attender, white woman by herself though let me say why i'm saying that specifically 
the critic of the lone female must be one reason God is getting your attention to be careful, mighty careful. Because I would say, friend, family member, loved one, will you go with me? And nobody would ever want to go. They, oh, we're too tired. Oh, we got to work. Oh, we don't have money to go. And I would go. And Lord and I would have fun. He's my friend. We'd sit in there and put our music on on our journey and just be with God like a little vacation alone with God. Nothing more. Not sinister. So at one point, there was in, well, 1998, it was so bad in my private life. And I had no, my father had died. I had no family member. I had no brother. I had no male. I was the mom of two young children. We didn't want anyone to know. And I was near collapse, literally. And I, a young man that was a friend and see, I had a person that was a male that was a house guest. Now this person, before I deal with any man, when you're married or not, I always check, is there chemistry from him to me or me to him? I even talked about it with this guy. Why did I talk to this guy? He had been abused. He had been very badly abused, and he had been a Marine. So he was giving me pep talks how to deal with the ah, horrible ah, demonic abuse. I'm an open book. Anybody who knew me, that really knew me, would know me. Did I invite people that were not in my board, these people that were the gossips and the toxic false religionists to tell them my private story? No, because if they were that prophetic, they would have known. <laughs> if they were that professional and strength as a senior top leader, they would have, if they thought it was their business, they should have Matthew 18 Galatians 6, 1 made an appointment to investigate by talking to me face to face. I'm a professional. So I was seen by one of the gossipers, this one kind of group, this kind of group that was like this. My board knew me. Nobody was, nobody was like that except this one kind of style of ministry. So I was seen with this person, and they thought, I guess, I was carrying on, having an affair. Did they... See, this is my lesson, because of all the accusation that y'all do. All old and young. You want to believe the worst, but are you really submitted to God's whole counsel? If it is your business to know before you gossip, before you blaspheme somebody's name and make God look bad, you are to Matthew 18, make an appointment, Galatians 6, 1, humbly make an appointment, in case you later are tempted with the same thing, if there is a temptation, to make an appointment. I found that this group, the most, tongue-talking, the most into submitting, are, she's not submitted. I'm going to tell you why. All right. So when I went... It was 1996, maybe. So when I went, after that, I was spied. Now, if I were carrying on, listen. If you're going to carry on, you're not going to be seen in public. You're going to slip around. So that's funny, too. I think that's weird. Because people are wired to see sin. Pharisee, hypocrite sin. All right. So this is the part when it started not being fun in ministry, when you're falsely accused, maligned. And I'm going to tell you why I know I was maligned. Because this is an illustration for false teaching. God wanted me to tell it to me. All right, so I was there, seen in a car. The man was a visitor from another state. A husband knew about it, not, you know, checked it out. People do have friends, you know, <laughs> that are confident. If you have no brother, God can send you somebody who's down to earth that can, you know, give you good wisdom or just, you know. So I thought, in hindsight, wow, I can't believe that. They could have called me up. They, 
people who know me would have asked me, you know, they love me enough to confront me and get it straight. So I was there and I thought, I saw that guy flinch and stare at me with this look that saw us together. And I was like, boy, what does he think? I had no clue that he'd go and be spreading the rumors about that I was caught, that I was caught. If I were caught, I'd do it on the sly. <laughs> Later, I found God gave me, God gave me scriptures of the test for adultery in the Old Testament. They drink something. If the woman is caught in adultery, and I guess the man, they are supposed to drink this whatever, and if they were really in adultery, their thigh would wither. I found that, and I laughed. I really did laugh, because it's so pitiful. That's just pitiful. Few and far between, but it's a point. Because it ain't just the only, you know, it's self-righteous. It's really, it's really a poor representation. So anyway, I went to, I, would, I was being abused. That person was gone. I went down to the March for Jesus a few weeks after, I guess. And I had my friend with me. And so my friend and I were walking in the March for Jesus. And I I'd felt in my heart, man, I'm just, I'd had a really big attack, abuse attack before the March for Jesus, the day before. And I was deplete. I was like exhausted. But I woke up that day and I couldn't hear God go or stay. And I thought, you know, I love Jesus. I'll go. And that's a lesson. Don't do it if you don't hear it. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you why. So I go down to the March for Jesus. I meet my friend. We're walking around. And all of a sudden, in the big crowd, waiting for the march, I see the guy who's buddies with this, you know, that group of characters that say they're Christian ministers that should be friends because I'm a fellow minister, not a novice. Have my own ministry, all right, known, all right, around town. So I'm standing there a bit numb from the day before, and they summon me over, the big autocrat. And in the process of me going, oh, I thought, oh, look, they're respectful. They're going to invite me because I'm a fellow minister around town, prophetic minister. And they're going to say hi, just being neighborly. And I thought, I'm going to go over, you know, being in ministry around town, knowing many people. So I went over there, and instead, this guy took at the March for Jesus, his liberty to ream me out in public. And he says, everyone know, and he called another minister who was head of the head of the ministers of that kind of group, the witch watching group. They called him over to be a witness. And I went, I was like numb anyway. And this guy was like a spirit, demonic spirit from the pit. He said, everyone knows you're out of, re you're out of order and in, in rebellion in your home. And that spirit on those words got me. And they rebuked me without submitting to Matthew 18, Galatians 6. They just did it in public because they wanted to. So I was like, in, it was a spiritual attack, attack, big attack on top of the other. So I went back numb and I had my sunglasses on and I put them on and my friend said, are you okay? I said, yeah. So I walked speechless like a zombie through the March for Jesus. Well, guess who we bumped into? We bumped into the head guy that he pulled over, the head of the path, the wife who knew me, and she said, is Tavo okay? I just went on. I mean, I couldn't say anything. I was exhausted. So after that, I started to, it was trauma. And what I saw is this goes on in the name of Jesus Christ following. I knew it was the devil, not a person. I went home and I started to write because I thought I was under as a multifaceted, gifted person, really am, this was a multifaceted attack of the most vile nature from every direction at home and in public under the name of Jesus Christ, a religious spirit. And I wrote about how to recover from a multi If you're multifaceted, you can have multifaceted attack at the same time. Took me years I, I had always loved being involved in the area-wide things. I couldn't go because that I went one time and that fellow, that autocrat, mean autocrat, glared at me and I was heavy with my own personal, pro, you know, weariness. I just thought, I can't do this. I did. Let me say this. I am not a wuss. <laughs> 
I'm not a frightened coward. After that happened that March day, I purposely made an appointment to Matthew 18, 15, speak and address with that man who did it that yelled at me, the autocrat, the authoritarian. I made an appointment and went to his office to try to speak and confront him. He, that spirit was so awful and haughty. So, I thought, I don't, he's not, there's nothing about this. It's about him. It's nothing respectful here. I'm going to leave. So I left and I learned the hard way about the traditional spirit of religion and biased accusation that many women and evil minded people do to the local female and male. When I was in that area, the Lord led me around the area. I was always around the area. He led me to a gathering of about 30 women. Turned out these same white women were nice people, nice as you can be, had been attacked the same crowd, gossiped about, called evil, witch-watching crowd. My mama had a single parent friend who is a really wonderful, capable female, strong lady, strong willed lady, but nice, respectful. And she had three children. She would shoot deer to have food for her children. A survivor. Those people, the head guy from that meeting cast her out of the meet of his church. There is because I watch who does what and the doctrines are the same. It's controlling. I think a cape, some people are triggered. We trigger controllers. I trigger false religion controllers. <laughs> Do we forgive them? Yeah, but why put your... They're assaulting humans, not just women. Humans made in God's image. Later, after I met 30 people, the same crowd had reviled, you know, had treated disrespectfully, demeaned. I met one gentle spirit white man of seven children that had a kidney problem gentle spirit who the authoritarian that openly called me out and ruined my name had done to him the same thing so there's a a neediness see what this is i'm not of that ilk and christians you should not be there is a neediness that does that on their part not mine there is a neediness. I'm content. I'm been contented. I'm godly content. I don't need to have a famous name. I've never needed it. I've just been sent by the Lord. And all I did, all we do, all of a lot of us, many of us, all we do is walk in and trigger that nasty, evil, demonic spirit in a Christian, a religious spirit. So finally, I'm going to slow the, you know, finish up here. The, I have two more, though. <laughs> they're so interesting. Thankfully, they don't haul, they're like rare, very rare, but they have happened more than three times. That's what I'm telling you. So the first time, the second time, 2003, this first time was like 1996. I was not going to be setting foot back in that crowd with that kind of poop taking over <laughs> the prayer movement that used to be so holy. <laughs> I'm not going to be <laughs> uh, putting my name, you know, my spirit in that. So I started going down to Florida, but also to Charlotte down there. And hate to say it, no matter how wonderful I liked them, I could see friendship. But that spirit, that august elite spirit of fault finding a person by typecast would rear up if I tried to say hello to the leadership that were and so i thought i'm getting racially profiled let me say this i like them it's just false teaching they can get they can move past that i have i'm not worried about it. i just teach on it so anyway i'd go down there and i just try to say hello and that spirit would rise up which i thought i'm being typecast racially profiled by white people so that's when i started in 1998 to discern groups and now i got wealth out of it 
I discern what if I get racially profiled here, but not with black, not with Baptist, not with Catholic, not with other kinds of Pentecostals, not with Vineyard. It's in the doctrine. I thought, what is it that I make this spirit flare? It must be my deliverance ministry. It's manifesting. So I pro racially profiled them back, and that's why I got Western European heritage, usually sedentary, um, all white male colonial red state and many of these who are gentrified used to be poor i was not raised poor i'm not you know i was not raised poor i was raised around them but we were gifts to them and serving them and not all people are poor it's just low i mean you, it's not a big deal it shouldn't be a big deal about your monetary status so I felt like I was striking something and then I'd go to different states and then I would have such warfare just to try to worship and sit there as a person. And it, I, you know, I really, and then Dallas was like the per capita of the nation, maybe the world, no fear of the Lord, just cultish, cliquish them. Do I forgive them? Yes. <laughs> But it's a huge thing. God said, if you see it three times or more, address it. So I am. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's a religious spirit. All right, so 2003, I'd not been in the group around that area of that kind in my former state before Dallas. And I thought, you know, there's a special lady intercessor I'd like to go here. And she happened to be at the church of one of those who were the spooky sin spires, you know, the occult whelp. I didn't know there were whelp back then, now I know. But it was the same, don't speak, just presume and scan them with your spectral evidence, like the Salem Witch Trials. Say that you know all about them, but never speak. That type of thing. Big. Really big. In these movements. So I thought, you know, I'm going to take this little old grandma lady with me who is a famous preacher's widow and uh, we'll be fine. So I felt led to go and we went the first night I go there with the lady because the lady was a real good speaker. And so I'm sitting there quietly as my usual custom, <laughs> smiling, regarding all the boundaries. So I'm sitting there and um, the guy, the head person, the chief apostle smiles at me. I thought, oh good, he's matured. I've matured. He's matured. Maybe this is, they'll, they'll be professional, you know. So I went there and then the next night I thought, you know, that lady was a good speaker. I'm going to go again. But I didn't take the widow with me. <laughs> when I went, calm service, at the end I saw a female who was in her 30s or 40s, early, thir late 30s, that I had talked to on the phone a couple of times, and she was, a, you know, she was one of their elders or deacons, but she had cancer. And I had talked with her before, and I felt on me that night faith for her cancer to be healed. I would do healing ministry as well. So faith for healing. So I went over there at the end of the meeting, calmly chatting to her and, you know, letting her tell me things, and I was going to have faith for her, to pray for her. Well, that was the downfall. They see me, they come over, the wife comes over and she says, so-and-so pastor, so-and-so wants to see you. I went, okay, let me go over there. I walk over there, I'm five foot ten, he's five foot three. I look down, he says, you are, everyone knows that you are a W witch and a Jezebel. Everyone knows, the pastors all know. And I looked at my heart. I looked at down at him and went, wow, who has talked to me? You've never talked to me. You've never, who, how do all the pastors know? Well, this is why I know. The pastors knew because they gossiped about me that I was that, but they none of them had ever talked to me in person or respected me. It was a cult, false religion. But it does this to many people. That's why we mention it around the area. Plus, they have networks in the deep south and all around that they warn people. The witch list. I found out when I spoke in Tampa one day. The witch list in national groups or local groups. Hey, doesn't bother me. You can ask me anything. 
nobody has ever asked me a thing, not a thing in 30 years, none of it. I think this is why I teach. It is, it is false. It is demonic, this type of fruit. If the fruit is demonic, better be, you know, it's, it's just attacking people for showing up looking like a certain, that is Salem witch trials, Google, you better Google spectral evidence. That's how they did it. The vibe, they go on vibe, look appearance. It's just hellish to do under the name of Jesus Christ, following Hebrews 10, 28, 25. So then I looked down, this man said, he accused me in public, no private one-to-one, -one, no prophetic professionalism, and I'm five foot not ten, and he's five foot three, and I looked down and went, all I did was, whoa, in my heart, I went, whoa, I don't, whoa, I looked at him and I said, you know, the wisdom of God is first in James 3:17. The wisdom of God is first of all pure, peaceable, and easily entreated. I'm all three. But that didn't matter. He gets, he walks me out. He says, You're never to set foot on the property again. I went, Whoa. I'm listening to me. I thought, Whoa. They thought I was a lone ranger. I said, But I've got a board. No, you don't. So I am escorted out, and he gets to enlist his help in comporting me out the door. A deacon who's five foot one. I'm laughing, and I'm like, whoa, what a picture! So he's walking me out the door, five foot one and five foot three, and it's night. And so at the door, I look down again to the five foot one deacon, and I say calmly, I said, but, because I'm accused. I am just unjustly accused, never spoken to, demeaned, openly rebuked. I'm a fellow peer past, you know what I mean? Whoa, whoa, what a big one. So I look down at this guy, you know, the deacon, and I say, but the, all I could say, I heard the Lord what to say, he said, but the wisdom of God, that's what I said, but the wisdom of God is first of all pure, peaceable, easily entreated, and I'm all three, and I just left calmly. So I get in my green mom van that I had back then, and I went, whoa, what have I just happened? First of all, not one of those people knew me. They were not my, they never asked me. No one has ever spoken to me, never has addressed it. All I knew is that first go jump me at the March for Jesus, that was their group. Wow. So I went home, and I told my father of my children, I said, this is what happened. And he was trying to be my friend. He says, I told you not to go there. There were a cult. You know, he never had, but he was trying to be sweet, you know. So then I went, what's my duty in this? To be called horrible. Names from the pit of hell. Accusation. False accusation. What do I do? So I called every board member. I had black ones, white ones, mostly men. Called five of them. Everyone said the same thing. I said, this is what happened. This is where it happened. This is what they said. And each one said, everyone, Tavo, we're so proud of you. You weren't hurt. And I went, you're right. I'm not. I wasn't hurt. It was weird and worth reporting, but it wasn't hurt. And I just want to say, this is why we teach. This is why we should teach and can teach. And we should not just blame people for not wanting to go to church and, you know, gossip about them because they don't go. They have reasons. They really do. Now, this is getting long, but there's one last. Like I said, if the Lord says, teach on it three times or more, thankfully, happily, these were seven years apart. So I go to Dallas. Long story short... I'm a, in a Caucasian ministry. You, oh, yeah. When I made my racial profile of the well, Western European Levitical Patriarchism, I realized there were hardly any black people in the group, in leadership. Maybe one. There were no women at the time. Now maybe they have a here and there once in a while. All right, so I realized I'm not dealing with my own kind. I'm not we colonial, I'm we global. I prefer to say it that way. I'm much more tribal, much more cross-racial, 
vibe. I don't expect to rule and own you. I don't need to be overseer of you. I want you to hear God for yourself. So all this has spawned big teaching. So in Dallas, I was new, and I was down there, and I was trying to find fellowship, and I'd lost my mate, and I was in grief because it was unplanned. It was shocking. I was given no say. It was a Malachi 2, sudden, all about that person's, you know, no contact, no face-to-face, just you're going to do it my way. And I went, whoa. So I had said, I'm not going to sign any divorce papers because I know you love me. And it had been following. And so I got served papers. And when I got served papers, like a demon hit me. I was, it was 11 at night coming in and they, it, grief, big grief. So it like, like I lost, like I was a widow. Nobody knew me. I go to this big church, famous minister, very famous minister, but they're all basically white. That didn't matter to me, I'm, but I'm very diverse. But I was going to, because I needed to be with the Lord. Good worship. So I traveled 45 minutes in the heat of Texas, and I went far away to go into the church. Well, I went there, and at the back I was sitting there, and I went there two times, maybe two years apart. The first time I went, maybe a year before, I'd gone... And I was talking at the back after a service, and they sent somebody back to to say, Who are you? Why are you here? Which I knew was witch-watching false teaching. So somebody's trying to call on this thing. All right, excuse me. So I ignored it, but it took me a while to go back. So I went back, and I thought, this day I feel, you know, I was dressed up because I thought, I'm going to go. Maybe I look like a Baptist to him. I don't know. These say they're prophets. They say they're true prophets. These, all these ones market themselves as true prophets, and they can't tell good from evil. Looks like. This handful, big handful. Isaiah 520 style. All right, so I go there at the end of the service. It was a good service. The head prophet apostle was not there. So at the end of the meeting, I thought, you know, I'm over there 45 minutes away in Plano or wherever I was. And I think it'd be good, like in you know my central Virginia area, to have a network in case of big need to get revel. You know, like I feel that maybe we need to pray for America or whatever something might happen. So I said to the brother of the famous person who is the leader that day, I went down to the church, calm, after perfect timing, nobody there in front of me. I went to introduce myself and say, maybe I could set up an appointment with somebody to have a meeting with one of your staff so that we can have a prayer network in case, you know, all be on the same team for the Lord community. When I walked down, quiet, calm, all I did was walk down. I went to introduce myself, and before I could, this man, this person grabbed me by my wrist and placed my wrist of the female into the waiting hand of a female white, shorter, and they're both shorter, shorter female who was an autocrat matriarch, a Levitical matriarch, <laughs> turned out. Why do I know this? All right. I was about to introduce myself, even after being disrespected, as an office peer, they could not tell, as a white woman. The typical stereotype, I guess. I'm just learning from this. That's my learning curve. All right. Pardon me if I'm learning. So I'm about to introduce myself as a fellow peer minister prophet apostle. Not famous. Not a capital A. Off scouring is fine. But I'm about to introduce myself expecting to be respected. All right. I couldn't get that out again. I was not allowed to say my name. Instead, I was openly rebuked for not being under spiritual authority. The person, the white woman, Levitical matriarch, said to me the following, You are not submitted unto spiritual authority. You're not submitted under authority. You need to be here. God has sent you to be here in our seats. I went, whoa. Back then, I had a board member in another state, but I had remaining board members and a new one out here. They knew that about me, standing calmly. That 
when I was grieving. So this spirit strikes with people that are hurting. Like Dan on the front porch steps. I've learned. When you're down, the devil wants to do you in. That's all I know. So she started to go on and keep on about me being not under spirit. I said, but, but. I realized this was the devil trying to get the focus into strife. I thought, I'm not going to do this. I'm not playing with this monkey. So I just sort of low key. I said, well, I'm going to go. She would not stop. So when I left and finally left, I was in the van or in my Highlander. And so as I left, I was like, oh, I came to get edified, comforted, and strengthened. I'm getting, I'm depleted. I had been through H grief. I didn't need this. But it taught me three times different states. This is the spirit on that whelp spirit. The accuser of the righteous. The accuser of the brethren and the mothering. The accuser spirit. So when I left, I thought I will never go back. I tried because I was 45 minutes away and tired and new. I tried to communicate because I am an upfront person. Nobody can say I'm not. Nobody can say I'm not E-O-R-R -R or easily entreated either. Or Matthew 18, 15, Galatians, humble Galatians 6, 1 compliant and submitted to that. I tried to communicate with that lady. I got this very defensive and not really nice letter back. So I thought, all right, let them be there. Let them see all the Jezebels they want to. That is your right. It is your privilege to see Jezebels and accuse false cues and hurt Jesus' name. That is your choice. So I've written many things out of this. A lot of really good has come out of it. I've gotten so frank. I've gotten so joyful. I've gotten so free. I've gotten, you know, a lot of that I think is pitiful. I think what I've seen is their self-pity, accusation from, oh, they're going to come up and disrupt our system, our team. It's about us against, it's paranoid, spirit of paranoia, prophetic paranoia. That's why I teach on it. That's why I'm speaking on it, because we care for them. We don't want them to be judged by the Lord or many, really, more than that. Innocent people, new people, people that don't know the Holy Spirit. People who've never met a real Christian, people who are black, who are brown, all kinds of people. Why is this happening under the state of Christ following, going to fellowship with the saints? Favor, not Phariseeism. Favor, not finding fault with a newbie because their look. Wow, that's amazing. So I'm finished with that. Hopefully we can go on to more positive things but I just had to say it this is how a lot of this teaching was spawned in this kind of weirdness <laughs> God is good as mercy endures bye bye